Do you struggle with discouragement, anxiety, depression, and despair, maybe even suicidal thoughts? If you do, you're not alone, and there's hope for you. So don't go away. Welcome to a three-part series called Finding Hope in Depression and Despair, and this is part one. We're going to talk about the problems that a lot of people go through. Uh, I've been through many of these issues. My guest has gone through many of these issues. Uh, we both have stories to tell, and we're here to share with you what uh, God has done in our lives, and we hope that it will be a big blessing to you. My guest is Christy Christopher. She is a registered nurse. She works at the Medical City Hospital in Dallas, Texas. She's a mother, she's a jogger, uh, she's a good friend of mine, and she's here to just share her story with you and to talk about uh, hope in the midst of all kinds of problems, which many of us have, so, yes. or have had. So Christy, thank you for being here. It's a privilege, thank you for inviting me. Yes, it's a, it's a privilege for both of us. Uh, I, I guess what I'd like to do at, at the beginning is to have you uh, give us a context to where we are actually right now at the time of this recording by telling us about your flight here from Texas coming to uh, to the Spokane area and then to Priest River. So the flight here, it was very almost ominous uh, going to the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Uh, my dad flies a lot and so he commented and said for a Monday morning, it's really quiet here. So there was much less traffic, a lot less people. Uh, the ticket counters were fully staffed. All the staff was there, but the people that were going to get help and needing to check in, it was it was pretty sparse. So DFW, it's generally a pretty packed airport. Yes, yes. Yeah, I used to live in Fort Worth, my wife and I, when we were first married. Uh, and so that was the airport that we flew in and out of a lot. And uh -huh. it was always full. Yeah. But so today it's not, it, or yesterday when you flew here, it wasn't that way. No, not at all. Not at all. And what's the big reason for that? The big reason right now is the coronavirus, which is sweeping the nation. And there are a lot of, um, as were mentioned by the CDC, recommendations to stay home. So a lot of people are self-isolating and self-distancing for the guidelines. Right, yes. Uh, those that will be watching this, at least in the near future, uh, everybody knows that, the, that we are living in a corona crisis. We live in a corona world. It's now a corona pandemic. Uh, President Trump recently declared a national emergency. Uh, the virus is spreading around the world. Different uh, countries have gone under uh, on lockdown. And there's just a whole host of things that are happening. And by the time people watch this, we still may be in the midst of this corona crisis, or maybe it will have blown over. Uh, nobody really knows what the future holds. Mm -hmm. But we do know that whether we're in it or whether we're out of it, that the issues that we're going to be talking about are, are relevant all throughout. And when, whenever people choose to tune into this program, uh, these issues are very real and they're going to be real until, uh, we believe, until Jesus returns and gets rid of sin. And we're looking, for, looking forward to that. Amen. So, uh, you want to just share something or are you about to say something? Okay, well, why don't we just talk, um, we want to move into uh, depression and despair and, and eventually you telling your story and I'll tell a little bit of mine. And let's just talk to start out with some of the statistics, you know, is, is depression a big problem in this world? What about suicide? Are these things going down or are they going up? Well, according to the World Health Organization, uh, close to 800,000 people die every year. That's one person every 40 seconds. So I would say that it's going up. And that's um, dying of? Of dying of suicide. Of suicide, they suicide take their lives. Deaths. So that's the amount of data that's available on the WHO uh, website. Yeah, and you, you, know, do you, you told me that you do know, you know of people I don't know how closely they were connected to you mm -hmm. or friends or, or something that uh, took their lives. Uh, I have an ex-boyfriend that actually took his own life um, here within the last three years. 
And so he, he took his life by suicide. Wow, yeah, and my, my stepbrother's daughter, it was just terrible. She, uh, she did the same thing. And so I, you know, just about everybody these days uh, has been touched by suicide. Mm -hmm. And you know, people just get so either depressed or discouraged, their, life, their lives just fall apart and they choose to take their lives. Other people are under medication Mm -hmm. And that's a contributing cause. Uh, there's a whole host of causes. So give us just a few more uh, statistics uh, as far as depression. You know, how, how big is depression in this world? Well, you were asking about uh, suicide rates, if they're going up or down. Sure. Um, per the CDC, 30% uh, suicide rate has actually gone up since 1999. And another statistic too is 54%, that's more than half of the people who died by suicide did not have a known mental health condition. So this is vastly underreported. Hmm. Yeah, here's a headline from, uh, from the CDC, suicide, this is from 2018, suicide rates in the United States continue to increase. Uh, and then it talks about from 2000 to 2016, uh, suicide has increased 30 percent. I think you mentioned that 30 percent. Mm -hmm. For females age 10 to 74, the suicide rates were higher than in the year 2000. And the same thing for males ages 15 to 74, they were higher than in the year 2000. And uh, this, this statement here says it's the 10th leading, or in 2016 it was the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. So, um, you know, it's a big problem. It's a huge problem. Uh, and as you share your story in a little while, and I'll share some of mine, um, I've struggled with those same thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm almost, uh, you know, it wasn't something that I, I grew up with, mm -hmm. but I, I reached a point in my life um, last summer, <laughs> and then a couple summers before that, where um, there were just these thoughts inside my head telling me, you just might as well just end it all. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't do it, thank it's God. <laughs> yeah, and, and you didn't need, I'm assuming you've struggled with some of the same mm -hmm. thoughts. Um, I have, I've, I've taken it a step further though. Um, I've had five suicide attempts and wow. uh, the one that had me go through a certain program that we'll get to, uh, I had, I live in Texas and so there's not as many gun laws and things like that. And so I had a gun and I didn't want to make a mess. Um, I had struggled with alcohol and I had been sober for six years and I fell off the wagon for lack of a better term. And so uh, I drank a bottle of tequila on my own, um, took the gun out to my backyard because I didn't want to make a mess and pulled the trigger. Uh, the gun jammed. <laughs> so. Wow. Well, thank God. Yes, you know. Yeah, you know, God really works in those emergency situations. Um, and we'll talk also later on about how, you know, sometimes he doesn't miraculously intervene mm -hmm. and people do take their lives. And a lot of people struggle with the issue of this, if God is really there and if he's a loving God, mm -hmm. why does he allow all of these things? Right. And how can he, you know, how can I pray to him and ask him to help me through this and the darkness is still there. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll talk about that because uh, I was in darkness for quite a while and mm -hmm. somehow, you. and you were too, and mm -hmm. somehow we both, we both uh, trusted the Lord. And I wanna also mention um, early on that you now work, uh, in addition to being a, a registered nurse at a hospital in Texas, mm -hmm. you also are one of uh, Dr. Neil Nedley's nurses during mm -hmm. the, his world famous the depression and anxiety recovery program. Uh, Dr. Nedley is a, a wonderful man. He's written numerous books, and this is one of his books called Depression, The Way Out. And he's an expert on depression and anxiety and despair and discouragement and how to help people. And so uh, Christy works with him. How many sessions a year approximately do you do you go to uh, his his location is in Weimar, California, Northern California. Mm -hmm. And you, it's like a, what, a 10 day program? It's 10 days. Uh, I do have a full-time job in Texas, like you mentioned. So what I'll do is I'll use my vacation time to go there. So I'm able to go about three to four times a year. 
three to four times a year. Yeah. And so you, uh, approximately how many people go through each session? It's approximately the normal program, although the waiting lists have gotten a little bit longer. Uh, about 24 participants is where they like to keep the number, but a lot of times what ends up happening is there'll be an emergent case that uh, Dr. Nedley will get a call from a psychiatric hospital, uh, a family that is pretty desperate at that point, and he'll make provisions to, to add them on mm -hmm. in certain cases. So sometimes we'll have a little more, sometimes a little less. Right. And, and uh, in the latter part of this series, we're doing three, three programs. Uh, now we're just sort of introducing the topic, then we're going to get into more of your story and then my story, uh, a little bit of my story and how we both found help and healing. And then we're going to talk about resources and more about Dr. Nedley's program and how there is hope for people today. Yes, and, and you absolutely. see that, don't you? And, and I've seen that yeah. uh, as you go through all these different programs. You have, uh, Dr. Nedley has, like you said, about 24 on average mm -hmm. or 20 to 24. Mm -hmm. And what kind of problems do they have who go through this program? Oh, it, it ranges. It's, it's uh, anywhere from relationship, because there's typically with depression, you'll have a relationship or a social consequence because there's a lot of things that we'll get into of with, that encompasses depression. Uh, we see a lot of financial difficulty, uh, depression being the number one reason for disability in our country right now. So it's kind of like a, a cycle. Um, so there's the relationships, divorce, uh, addiction is a big one. Um, so there's, there's a pretty wide range that gets addressed in the program. Yeah, here's a statement from the Hope for Depression Research Foundation that says depression is a serious medical condition that is associated with symptoms such as melancholy, loss of pleasure, loss of energy, difficulty in concentrating, and suicidal thoughts. And here's uh, another quote from the World Health Organization. It says depression is a common mental disorder. Globally, more than 264 million people wow. of all ages suffer from depression. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide wow. and a major contributor to the overall global burden of disease. So it's a big problem. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, I was, I, I know that as you've gone through these different programs with Dr. Nedley, helping people who have all kinds of issues, uh, you've seen some real turnarounds, yes, haven't you? Yes, yes. It's, it's my absolute passion to work in this program and to give back. And that's one of the greatest gifts is to be on the front lines and see this, these very issues. Uh, I mean, nothing's perfect, but you see such a miraculous turnaround that it it's brings such joy to see. And it's, it's hopeful for each one of us, too, as staff. Right. And for you and I, and it's just, it's a gift that just, you can't outbless God. So it's yeah. a beautiful transition to see people transformed. Definitely. Yeah, I remember uh, when I went through his program in 2017, there was one young girl, I won't mention her name, but she was probably about 19 years old, maybe 18. And when mm -hmm. she first came to Dr. Nedley's program, uh, and I was one of the participants, I tell you, she was just like a zombie. Mm -hmm. I mean, she would walk around and it was just like there was nobody up there, nobody yeah. home. She didn't talk. She was just, just like, you know, almost like a comatose person walking around. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as the days went wore on, as the program continued on, little by little, life came back into her until we got to the end and she was laughing, she was talking, she was smiling. And I mean, everybody just looked at her and just went, wow, this, <laughs> is, this is a miracle. Yeah. This is a miracle. Yeah. And so, and, and I'm sure uh, in, in a time of this corona crisis, where uh, you know the financial markets have been just reeling, and people are out of many people are out of work. The the airline industry has really taken a huge hit. The cruise industry has taken a huge hit. Mm -hmm. Now it's you know restaurants, small businesses, uh, sports have been canceled, and the list just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know this will probably uh, contribute to more mm -hmm. anxiety and depression and fear. And, and possibly suicide. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really feel that as we're, as, we're, uh, as we're doing this, we feel this is providential. 
that we're doing this at this time because this is a tremendous, um, almost an apocalyptic moment in American history, in global history, and there was never a time when people needed God more and needed hope more and needed help more. And so that's, that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. We feel like this is, a, this is a tremendous providential opportunity for us mm -hmm. to share the principles that people really need. Yes. So why don't we, um, would you want to say something else, sir? Uh, okay, yeah, well, okay, why don't we just, let's go back to uh, your background and tell us, you know, where you were born, a little bit about your, your early life, your middle life, and then we'll, you know, move into how you entered a crisis that you said, you know, five times you mm -hmm. tried to take your life. Yeah. So let's just go back, <laughs> rewind. <laughs> okay. Um, I was born in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, my dad had us move around a lot because he worked in for AT&T and different telecommunications companies. And so he was a computer, he still is a computer engineer. And so growing up, I moved around a lot. So we went, lived in Pennsylvania, Indiana, Texas, Washington State, um, Florida, Tennessee, North Carolina, wow. and then back to Texas. And so we've been there since 98, so I claim Texas is home. Uh, but growing up and moving around a lot, uh, different people handle things in different ways. Um, for me, that was very hard to be the new kid and uh, have to start over everywhere. Uh, looking back on it now, I see it in a different way that it was actually a blessing because I got to meet a lot of really good people around the country and have different experiences. Are you an, um, an only child? I do have a brother. He is 11 years younger, and so he's actually a youth pastor. Oh, so, wow. uh, he and I, growing up, we took different courses. He, he remained... Um, I hate to use the word straight and narrow, but he, he was, he, he had a goal in mind and he went for that goal. I kind of veered, <laughs> kind of veered and, and made some poor life choices and uh, took a different track, but I'm thankful, you know, that it brought me to where I'm at today is I so believe I've a, learned a lot of things. So you grew up in a Christian home? I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, mom and dad were together, um, very spiritual home, uh, not a lot of problems in the home. I had a happy childhood. Okay. So the, it, was, it was a good foundation growing up. So, you know, I did have a happy childhood. That's, that's wonderful. So. We, all, we all need that, and so, and so many don't have that. Right. right. Um, my, my childhood was, I grew up in the Hollywood Hills in Southern California, and it, our family was not a, a Christian family. So we never read the Bible, we never prayed, we never went to church. We did go to synagogue every once in a while because we were uh, Jewish, but not really religious. Uh -huh. And then when I got into my teenage years, I just went off the deep end. I was surrounded by drugs and the entertainment industry and mm -hmm. long story, but it was, um, it was pretty bad. So, you, you know, thank God you had a, a good upbringing and, mm -hmm. and mine was too. My, um, my parents, you know, did their best to, to love me and my brother and my sister, um, but they, they uh, had problems in their marriage and they were, uh, they divorced when, when I was 16. Okay. And then mm -hmm. I moved in with my dad and my brother and sister moved in with my, with my mother. And uh, because I didn't have, you know, the, the guidance, the moral guidance that I needed, mm -hmm. uh, I was just a, a sitting duck pretty much to mm -hmm. the temptations that surrounded me. Yeah. And then when I was 20 years old, I started reading the Bible, <laughs> this book. Yay. Really, uh, yeah, yay, this is the book that changed my life. So. Yeah. So in your case, um, you started out in a Christian home and then you sort of went in the wrong direction. Right, right. Um, I got into alcohol abuse. Um, kind of going back though, I'd struggled with depression since the age of 12. And right. so I was in and out of um, doctor's offices, basically on a carousel of trying different medications. And so it would reach a certain efficacy and then they would change the dose or up the dose or try something different. And so it was kind of like a revolving door. Um, you know, I'd have a little bit of relief and I could function and it was okay. You know, I was able to go through nursing school and um, eventually work in an ICU intensive care setting. Uh, but there was a lot that was still unresolved, I guess you could say, like um, just 
kind of this program running in the background that I didn't really know what to call and it became a new normal and so I didn't know there was a different way to feel or a different way to live because that was just kind of what I got accustomed to so it was difficult. Now, I, at 12 years old, you said you first got depressed or you've been struggling with depression since you were 12, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm just curious um, if you can explain a little more about, you know, why would a 12-year-old girl growing up in a Christian home in a good family, mm -hmm. do you know why you started struggling with, with depression? And, and what did that look like when you were just a little girl? At that age, I don't don't believe I had the the terminology to know what it was. I just knew that something wasn't right. And so mom and dad didn't know what to do. And so they took me to the primary care doctor. And so it wasn't anything that, you know, I went to mom and dad and said, oh, hey, you know, this is what's happening. They just knew yeah. something wasn't right also. So they relied on the, the PCP to diagnose that. And then you so. were diagnosed as having depression? Yes, yeah. So do you know, looking back, do you... Can you put your finger, you said there was a program running in your background or in mm -hmm. your mind, is that yeah. what you're referring to? Yeah. So, I mean, can you put your finger on what was that program telling you? Do you know why that happened? Was it just because of the spiritual battle that we're all in or were there any events that, uh, you know, kind of tipped you in that direction? Uh, looking or do you know? back, I mean, at, at the time, you know, I didn't have a real good understanding, so I don't really know. Um, <laughs> You know, having gone through some other things and having learned some things about depression that I know now, I see what it could have been. But at the time, we didn't know. Like, there's a lot of things um, that it was just kind of a, a low-lying dread. Um, at that age, typically, most kids want to get out and play and, you know, be involved, which I did do some of. But I would have been okay just kind of hanging out in my room not really going outside. So there's just some telling signs that it, you know, depending on what you compare it to, it wasn't normal per se. You became more of a hermit. Right, right. You like to be alone. More. Right, right. And were you just down? Yeah, I'm just, just kind of wanting to listen to music, uh, rock. I, I got really into rock music. And so that became kind of my comfort is media and rock music and um, things to distract. So. Yeah, and some of those rock and roll songs contribute to suicide. Yes. I, mean, I used to listen to a song. I remember when I, I started smoking marijuana when I was 14 years old, and then I started getting into drinking and, mm -hmm. and the parties, etc. And I remember one song, uh, I still remember the words, Don't Fear the Reaper, mm. Take My Hand, yeah. You'll Be Able to Fly. Yeah. Uh, and it was, you know, encouraging people. The music was very mellow and seductive, mm -hmm. but the words were really telling you, you know, to uh, take your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, you know, a lot of kids probably do that because of the influence of some of these songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And there's a lot of subconscious influence too, mm -hmm. that it's when you may not be conscious of, because it goes through a different part of the brain. And so it's not even something that, you know, the frontal lobe, which is the analytical part of the brain, it bypasses it and goes right to the temporal lobe. And then it becomes part of your subconscious and you don't have a reasoning to stop what you're hearing. Okay. So it's more influential. So you, so your, your um, family physician put you on medication. Yes. And how, how did that work? Did um, that help you? Did it... You said they changed your medication often? Yes, yes. It just, it was more just like a Band-Aid. And so it would help for a little while. Like, you know, it was, I could notice a difference. My mood was elevated temporarily, maybe for, you know, I think the most that it lasted was maybe six months. And then I was able to go about and things were semi-normal then, but it wasn't a solution. In your experience with Dr. Nedley, uh, do most depression drugs work or do most of them not work? Do any of them work? Do none of them work? What's, give us kind of a, just a generalization. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some that, that work, but a lot of them come with black box warnings. And so it increases impulsivity. And so suicide is an impulsive act. And so if you give a depressed patient one of these black box, black box warning drugs, then their suicidality actually goes up. 
So any of these medications, they, they have some efficacy, but it's just so important that they're given under a physician's guidance and that no one just abruptly stops them either. So it needs to be tapered off with a physician. It's very important that that, with brain chemistry, that it's not just abruptly stopped. Now, now isn't it true that you know, some depression is because of a brain chemistry issue? Yes. And other depression is... I mean, I would imagine that all depression ultimately is connected to brain chemistry, but aren't there, in some cases, it's just, you know, a, a brain chemistry issue uh -huh. unrelated to uh, certain events in a person's life, but other times there's, there's like you lose your job, you have a divorce, mm -hmm. you know, there are precipitous events right. that contribute to depression. And in that case, wouldn't it be true that, that uh, medication, you know, if it doesn't address the underlying issue, then it's probably not going to be a permanent solution. Whereas if it's dealing with your brain chemistry issue, you know, it may help to set things right. Is that right? Right, right. And that's true because there's situational depression too. So it may have nothing to do with brain chemistry per se. So there's lab work that is helpful because then you're able to get data and have some evidence to treat with. Mm -hmm. um, but not everything is you can draw a lab for you know, with, you know, a loss or something like that. Then right. Well, that, that's, that's one of the beautiful things about the beauties of Dr. Nedley's program. Right. Is that he does, I remember when I was there, I think they did nine blood draws. <laughs> yes. And he's looking at all these different things and looking at my chart and I'd have my counseling appointments with him and he would say, oh, I see this, 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 yes. and this. I know why you have anxiety, why you have insomnia, why you can't sleep, why you're depressed. Right, it's right. all right there in front of me. Mm -hmm, and he said, you safe. need these vitamins, this, 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 and this, and yeah. you need to up the zinc and the mm -hmm. B6 and and uh, eventually everything just kicked back into normal. <laughs> right, right. And that's the same with, with my labs as well. He did the same thing. And so like all the things that you just mentioned, like zinc and P5P and uh, the different data that he basically was able to have a supplement for that. And so that definitely helped the brain chemistry. So yeah, that was, that and, was and again, thing. we'll talk more about Dr. Nedley's program. So back to your, your, your timeline, uh -huh. uh, your, your teenage years, tell us more about, you said 12, you started struggling with this, you were off and on, uh -huh. on uh, antidepressant medications. Mm -hmm. And what were your teenage years like? You said your brother kind of went, yeah. he stayed with the Lord, yes. but you went the other way. Yes, I did. Um, teenage years were okay. Um, again, it was still moving around. Um, you know, I enjoyed school. I liked being in school. There were some really high points as well, so I don't want to paint it, you sure. know, entirely one direction either. But, um, you know, again, there was still just this, this thing. I just could not put my finger on what, what could possibly be wrong. Cause I just did, something was just not a hundred percent Like that cloud, right. just, a cloud just a cloud over you. Sometimes they call it the black dog, mm -hmm. you know, something that it's just pervasive and it affects a lot of different areas of, of life. Um, so going through college, um, you know, again, it was more kind of hanging out with not the best crowd, going to rock concerts, um, you know. Um, so you're really veered away from the church, yeah. the church crowd. Did you continue yeah. to go to church during those days or I did you stop? I did occasionally. I went occasionally, but um, not for maybe the best reasons, more to meet up with friends and more like a social event type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so I still, I still believe in God. I still loved God, but I didn't know what a true relationship with him really was. I think kind of looking back. So I struggled a lot with just feeling disconnected and trying to, f just feeling lost, I guess you could say, just not having a clear direction, so. But you knew you wanted to be a nurse. Yes, yes, I did have direction there, um, you know, in terms of school, you know, I did fairly well in school, that wasn't the issue, it was more just overall life satisfaction, just kind of knowing like, you know, feeling, I guess, at peace, you could say. So, so your friends though, the friends, you said wrong crowd. Mm -hmm. They they pulled you in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the same thing that happened to me, and it happens to a lot of kids. You know, you get into your teenage years, and then continuing on, and you you know you if you don't have a strong walk with God, if you're not really reading His Word on a regular basis and praying on a regular basis, and even if you are, you can still be uh, pulled into the wrong influences and I didn't have any moral base at all really mm -hmm. and so I just went from one thing to another 
marijuana and then cocaine and the parties, the rock concerts, the same kind of thing, the alcohol, mm -hmm. the drinking. And okay. uh, some of my friends that I grew up with, they, they died. Mm -hmm. I remember Lisa. She, I got word that she had overdosed on quaaludes mm -hmm. and then Michael, Michael Prey. Uh, he, I don't know, I think he, I think he drank so much he got a, a liver disease mm -hmm. and that killed him as a, as a young man. So and it could have easily happened to me, um, and it happens to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's tragic. So let's keep going down farther. Um, you eventually got married. Uh, I did get married. Um, I married another nurse, and we had a beautiful child. His name is Liam, mm -hmm. and he's seven. He's turning eight soon in the end of April. So yeah, you were telling me a little about him. He's awesome. I just love him so much. I'm so grateful for Liam. Um, he's. He's a very unique child. He loves clocks. He, he loves numbers and he has a clock collection. And so he's just a fun little guy. You have to talk to him. He, he's never met a stranger. He's very chatty. Um, but he's, I do have a beautiful son. Um, unfortunately, I did get divorced. So um, the divorce was very difficult. You talked about losses and it, it was a tumultuous time. Um, I think that may have been the tipping point of what kind of led me to seek help with Dr. Nedley's program. Um, that was not something that, um, it was a pretty discouraging time. So I just felt like a failure. I felt after like the after the divorce. And so there's a lot of thoughts that were going in my head that, that you had mentioned before that, what's the point? Like, why am I still living? So it was those suicidal thoughts I think really um, tipped at that point. Now, had you, prior to the divorce, had you ever attempted to take your life? Um, I had one other time. It was while you were married or before you were married? Uh, it was while we were married. And do you, do, what do you attribute, do you attribute that to, were you still on medication at that time? Antidepressant medication, was that a contributing factor or was it just because things weren't going well in your marriage? It, or it's both? hard to say, I mean, it's difficult to really pinpoint what it was. Um, I know I struggled really bad with uh, postpartum depression. And so after Liam was born, um, I was struggling pretty hard at home. So that was difficult. Mm -hmm. And then you said that the, di the divorce that really contributed to your, your slide. Yes. So just you know, keep keep going with um, with what happened. Tell people what happened. A lot of people, you know, when 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 we tell our stories, other people can can say, I, I can relate to that. That's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, when they go through things, I I, I know for me, uh, when I went through Dr. Nedley's program the first time around, it was very um, in a strange way. It was, it was shocking and it was, in a strange way, it was encouraging to see other people <laughs> going through the same kind of things that I was going through because I think there's a, there's a tendency to, uh, when people go through real problems, to think that nobody, nobody knows right. what I'm going through. I'm the only one that's got this problem. Right. And there was a Bible verse that I, I read that said, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. <laughs> I think that's First uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, I think, just going by memory. And so I would think, is, is this possible that what I'm going through is common to man, that other people go through this too? Yeah. And then when I went through Dr. Nedley's program, I saw firsthand, because a lot of people don't talk about these mm -hmm. things. Right. And, and I saw it firsthand that you know, this person and this person, we, we would sit in the, in the hot tub as you know, part of his program is you go in the hot tub and then right. they put you in a cold bucket of water. <laughs> Hydro <laughs> Hydro yeah, hydrotherapy. And then you're back in the hot tub for about four minutes or five minutes. And yeah. you're back in the, in the tub of uh, ice mm -hmm. for 30 seconds. Right. And you go back and forth, back and forth, sometimes uh, two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. and, you, and so we would sit in the hot tub and with the guys that, you know, they separated the men and the, and the women once we did hydrotherapy. and. And these guys are just telling, you know, the same kind of stories that I'm going through. And then, of course, at the end, 
if they want to, people get up and they share their stories. Mm -hmm. And you just think, wow, I'm not alone. Yeah. A lot of people have experienced things like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So for me, it was comforting. Yes, no, I to know. I mean, I didn't, you know, I say I didn't want other people to struggle, but to know that I wasn't alone and that people could relate, mm -hmm. that was really valuable to me. Yeah, there's there's something that's very connecting with um, vulnerability because they talk about that that vulnerability is basically the birthplace of empathy, and so if you can relate with someone else, that's such a connecting piece, and to know that you don't have to struggle alone. There's, like you said, there's value in that because right. then you can also help each other. Yeah, that's right. There's a little book that we'll talk more about uh, later on. It's a little book I wrote called Help for the Hopeless. Help for the Hopeless. And there's a person on the cover that's just, he's in the dark and he's got his hand on his head and he's, he's just really down, really down and out. And the uh, subtitle here says, My Escape from Insomnia, mind-altering medication, dark depression, and mental torture. And for me, I mean, I am this, my title is speaker director of Whitehorse Media. I'm a minister. I've been a minister for years. I've given seminars on the Bible, spoken in front of crowds, done radio interviews. We've produced TV programs. And it wasn't until 2017 that I just really, I just bottomed out. Mm -hmm. And and then when, and when uh, I by the grace of God, I got through that. I wrote this book, and this is, you know, my story. And I remember that when this book first came out, and I finally decided I'm going to go public with this, and I'm going to write this book and tell the story. That I, we were just, uh, our, our office was just cascaded with emails and phone calls and people that just said, you know, thank you for being vulnerable mm -hmm. and for telling your story mm -hmm. because they you know they would say things like you know most people that are you know in my position they don't do that mm -hmm. and for them to see other people struggling just like like they're struggling mm -hmm. it's encouraging to people especially when when god brings you through Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you when you when you when you don't just go down but that you get up oh, that's right god that's right. brings you up Amen. god builds you up and Amen. there's a lot of promises that we'll we'll yes. look at later many, many promises in the Bible that I'm sure you have yes. precious promises yeah. I want to focus on at some yes. point. What were the key promises that helped you? Mm -hmm. And I'll share right. some of the promises that helped me because really I know, and I think we both know that we're only, we're here by the grace of God. Amen. That, that's right. It's a miracle of the Lord yes. that he can get a hold of anybody yes. uh, and then bring us through very, very dark times. That's right. So, okay, let's go back to, um, you know, how did things develop were you when you you know that led you to the bottom and then how did you find out about dr nedley's program and we've got plenty of time in this program and the next program we've got three three hour three one hour sessions mm -hmm. and then i want you to eventually um go into you know the process that got you out okay. of the depression and the suicidal thoughts and those kind of things so tell the story. Okay. <laughs> so um, part of the, the story was um, I had ended up after the gun did not go off by God's grace. Uh, I had called my dad and a friend to come over. My friend uh, is a gun expert. And so he checked out the gun, said there's no reason that the gun shouldn't have gone off. Um, my dad spent the night with me. The next day he took me to a psychiatric uh, hospital. So I was admitted. Uh, basically under, um, you know, physician supervision and it was under lockdown and all those things because I was still, you know, suicide under watch, suicide right? watch. And, yeah, and so, where was this? Uh, what, what? This was in Texas, in Fort Worth. Okay. So that's where, um, where I was taken. And um, in the middle, I was also on a lot of medications. And so I was on high dose benzodiazepines. So it's going to be like your lorazepams, your Ativans. Uh, Valium, those type of medications. And with the alcohol component, the psychiatric physician decided to take off the benzo completely. And so uh, that's considered not a good plan because it can cause seizures, it can cause, you know, life-threatening brain 
chemistry issues. So he wanted, he took you and off the benzo because you were on, you were drinking at that yes, point. Yes, yes. So and he didn't just tell you to stop drinking. He just no. he just adapted to what he thought was best based right. on the fact that you were drinking. Right, because basically the benzos are like alcohol in a pill form, and so he didn't want that to be part of the treatment plan. And so I started to have auditory hallucinations. I thought the staff was against me. Um, I thought I needed to get out of there. Uh, a lot of things that were not congruent with reality. So I, I'm cognizant of this. I just didn't know what to do about it. So it was terrifying. And you attribute um, that to the, the benzo to that the you benzo, were on? To the benzo, yeah, just being And what was the particular tricky. kind that you were on? Um, it was Ativan. So I was up to four milligrams a day which is a very high dose. Um, so he put me on another medication basically to treat the psychosis and put me on some other uh, high dose psychiatric medications. And so it was basically giving more meds. Um, at that point, my mom had heard about the Nedley Depression and Anxiety Program. Uh, I wanted nothing to do with God. Uh, I was very like angry. And now, was just, that because of the benzos or was that, uh, had that been building for a while? Um, that had been building for a while. It had nothing to do with the, taking the medications away. So that was okay. kind of a separate issue okay. uh, compounded with everything else. Um, I was on Adderall for ADHD, uh, Trazodone for sleep, uh, on an antidepressant. I think it was Cymbalta. Um, it was like six different medications. And some of them were working in opposition of each other. So the whole treatment plan just didn't make sense. <laughs> it's just basically like throwing Band-Aids you know, on all these different issues. And um, so... So they were just, you know, my, I have a relative that often says sometimes uh, they, they just, physicians practice medicine. Uh -huh. And he uses that <laughs> as a joke. Yeah. So it sounds like that's what was happening in your case. Yes. They were just deciding, well, let's try this or let's try this. Precisely. And they weren't looking at how they all work to get... Now, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in when you said it, it wasn't the, the drugs that you were on that made you not want God uh -huh. You were already going in that direction for a while. Yes. And, yes. and, and so go, go, go into that a little bit more. Why did you, after, you know, growing up in a Christian home, what led you to the point where you just decided, I, I don't want him? Was it because of the cloud that you were under that was still there? Was it your marriage? You know, what, what was it that led to that? Um, I don't know if I can really, like, articulate exactly when that happened. I think it was a slow progression, um, just, you know, kind of letting out the threads here and there, compromising here and there, uh, not seeing that I, that was really the solution <laughs> to a lot of and things. he was the solution. That he's the solution and, and just really rejecting that, that still small voice and not, not, um, you know, not doing as, as he says, basically a very rebellious spirit. <laughs> so just, you know, I'd, I'd struggled a lot with that. So, and seeing the true picture of who God is, I didn't have a good understanding of, of how he is. And yeah, well, what was your understanding at that point? Um, at that point, I felt like, or I was thinking that he was more like a judging God, that he was looking at the things that I wasn't doing and basically saying that, you know, you're too bad, you know, you've done too many bad things in your life that I'm going to just not accept you because you're too far gone. And so I realized that was not God speaking to me. That was the devil because there's a thought from hell, there's a thought from heaven and that God would not speak in that way. So I recognize that now, but going through it, I had that, those thoughts that, you know, I was just too far gone. Yeah, I've had many of those thoughts. I can totally relate to that. And, and I think in my case, I think the medication that I eventually went on, my situation really started with insomnia mm -hmm. uh, in, in June of 2017. Uh, I, for some reason, I just wasn't able to sleep. I, I woke up at two in the morning and couldn't go back to sleep. And, and then I started taking some, uh, I think it was Tyl Tylenol PM and more melatonin and some of the milder things and they didn't they worked for a little while and then they stopped working and then I tried uh, somebody recommended Advil mm -hmm. no not Ad I'm sorry not Advil it was Ambien oh, and yeah. I tried Ambien and then that worked for a little while and then that stopped working and then mm -hmm. I went farther and farther and then eventually I some of my uh, 
physician friends, uh, well-meaning, were trying to help me because I was, wasn't was sleeping. Um, mm -hmm. I'd go all, the entire night without sleeping. Oh, no. And then they put me on, um, I believe it was Trazodone mm -hmm. or maybe Seroquel. And then eventually it was uh, Lorazepam, which mm -hmm. was a benzo. Yeah. And it just I just spiraled mm -hmm. uh, one after another. And it really started with I couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. And you know, here I am a minister and I've got responsibilities. I have a family, I have my wife and my, my daughter mm -hmm. and my son and uh, a whole host of things that I, I toggle and <laughs> multitask in mm -hmm. my daily life. And, yeah. and you know, when you, when you lose sleep consistently, your, your mind just begins to unravel. Mm -hmm. right. And so I went on these medications because I didn't know what else to do. And that was what eventually led me to Weimar was when I was on um, lorazepam and I, I called Dr. Nedley because mm -hmm. I'd known him for a long time from a different situation. And then I told him what I was going through uh -huh. and I wasn't sleeping and I was on lorazepam. And he told me, I still remember that conversation. I was standing outside of my wife's parents' house on my cell phone and he said to me, he said, Steve, you've got to get to Weimar right away. Mm -hmm. You got to get down here and go through the depression and anxiety recovery program because mm -hmm. we've got to get you off that benzo mm -hmm. or or this is not no he didn't tell me this at the, in the conversation but later he told me that when he had that conversation he thought to himself this is not going to end well oh, wow. that was that was the term he used this okay. is not the phrase he used this is not going to end well mm -hmm. that's the way he so wow. he was reflecting uh but he didn't tell me that as a physician you know right. on the phone he I just told me <laughs> he said you need to get yeah. down here to weimar and Let's... go through our program as quick as possible and that was uh that phone call took place on a uh, I believe it was a sunday and then he said that we have uh we have 20 people registered or we're going to take 20 uh -huh. at that point for the next program which starts thursday this was a sunday he said it starts thursday mm -hmm. and then he said we have one opening oh wow and i can squeeze you in wow praise god and so uh by tuesday i was on a plane wow and my wife i remember her helping me pack because at that point i was just you know i had gone through multiple nights without sleeping and now these these medications were affecting my mind, mm -hmm. and I was having all kinds of uh, thoughts that were not normal to me, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know, and those negative thoughts, mm -hmm. those negative thoughts, just right. keep hammering you yes. one after another. You're hopeless. There, God doesn't love you anymore. There, there, there's no way out of this. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do. Right. Uh, and there's a whole lot of other things that went on inside my head, yeah. which you can relate to. I can relate to, yes, absolutely. Okay, a lot so of those um, things. <laughs> yeah, so so how'd you get to Weimar? <laughs> um, kind of a little bit more to the story. Um, I'd met a uh, some friends in an intensive outpatient program. I thought they were my friends, and um, I I went on some dates with a millionaire that is was in recovery for alcoholism and so you know i had this relationship with this this millionaire in this recovery program and, and this was still in this in was the, still in, in the Texas. fort worth area yeah and um i ended up uh making some friends that one friend decided that he wanted to take a certain medication and put it under his tongue and um, my dad was in a near fatal car accident and so he had this medication and so I got this medication for this person and he went into respiratory distress uh, in my car so with, this was your millionaire boyfriend this was someone else oh, there's two else. separate people okay. I'm sorry right. I wasn't sorry. clear um, so uh, with my ICU training I was able to basically run the code put everything that was happening um, put his head back, call EMS. They stabilized his airway. He never had to be intubated to have the artificial airway. Uh, he was taken to the hospital. He survived. So everything was okay. And this was all um, after you got out from your suicide out, you know, intervention gun, and all right. that. Right. So this is, and so that gave me the idea. And so I basically put an uh, app on my phone that erased my location. Um, I packed some bags, drew, drove an hour outside of my town to Glen Rose, um, booked a hotel and attempted the same thing. 
I woke up three days later on my same side. Uh, in the ICU setting, we turn patients every two hours to maintain circulation. So what, what did he, what did he take, your, take, your friend take that put him into that state? Um, it was a fentanyl patch. And so typically it's extended release. You put it on the skin and it's released over 72 hours and you change it every 72 hours. Um, but he cut it in force and then put it sublingual. And so I had never heard of anything like this. And so when you, when you, when, when you helped him survive, he, that gave you the idea to try to idea. do the same thing. Precisely. And, um, to kill yourself. Right. Right. So that was, um, that was unsuccessful. And so I called my dad and they So you said you woke up after three days? After three days. I could not feel this you side. Out. Yeah. I, and I don't know why they never checked on me, which seems odd at a, a hotel, but they didn't. And so, yeah. No cleaning kinda, ladies came in? No or? one, nothing. Very odd, very odd. So um, I, that's what took, took me to the program. It was basically in the program that I had the interview from Leanne. I don't know if Leanne okay, well, interviewed yeah. you. No, but still, let's let's back up. You 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 survived those three days. Right? Yes, you were like yeah. you were out for three days. I was out you for three days. You woke up. You yeah. survived, and then you, did you realize that and think to yourself, um, "I want to live. I don't want to die." And I almost killed myself, but I didn't. And so uh, I need help. Is that what you were thinking? Uh, at that time, I was still pretty numb, so there wasn't. A lot of rational thought at okay. that point. Just a whirlwind. And so it was just more just wanting relief from pain. I mean, it was just you know, as you know, with depression, it was just an intense amount of emotional pain, and I, you know, there's no really origin of it. It's just it was mm -hmm. just you know, I wasn't sure how to handle it, and obviously was not handling it. And did you say that was was that your fifth time that, that you tried to take time. your? That was it. Mm -hmm. So there were three other times between the gun. And that, that last one, mm -hmm. the three days when you were out. Yeah. So when you when you came to again, how did you get? How did you learn about Dr. Nedley's program, and how did that happen? It was actually my mom that had heard about it from a friend who had gone through the program, and so she had been praying about it and asking God to give her wisdom on how to basically help her daughter. And so she had a friend in Houston that worked at the conference office that basically she reached out to and she knew Dr. Nudley was going to be speaking in Houston. And my mom felt this incredible impression to call her friend right at that moment. And she knew that Dr. Nudley would not be in Houston until the next day, but she did it and she listened to the Holy Spirit. And she called her friend and she said, you'll never guess who's standing right in front of me right now, but Dr. Nudley. And so her friend hands Dr. Nudley the phone, says that, you know, there's this case. I don't know if you can deal with this in your program. It's pretty intense. And um, he, he said, oh, sure, we'll, we'll make room for her. And it's kind of like your you story. Heard of, had you heard of him before? I t had never really heard much about Dr. Nudley. I didn't know who so he was. You, you didn't know that he was a, a Seventh-day Adventist physician whose field of expertise is the brain, brain chemistry, and helping people get over depression and suicide, the suicidal thoughts. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So he was, uh, it was a godsend. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I felt the same way when I finally landed at that program that I don't know where I would have been if, if it wasn't for God using that program yes. to help me. Amen. I'm with you. So, um, so he, you talked to him on the phone mm -hmm. and you told him what was going on. Actually, it was my my mom that talked to him on the phone, and because I was still in the the hospital, but uh, he's like, "Yeah, send her over." That sounds like a majority of the cases we get here. <laughs> so, wow! And and uh, <laughs> how, from that point of your mother's conversation with him, how many days beyond that was the did the program begin? Was it like th that week or next week? It was about the next week. Uh, Mom and Dad were like, oh, hey, you're going to California. You can go hang out by the pool. It's going to be like a vacation. <laughs> it's like, sign me up. <laughs> That's kind of how they got me to go. <laughs> really? So, so they don't have a pool at Myanmar. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't quite like that. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> yeah, so, wow. Yeah, I didn't know what I was getting to, getting into either when Dr. Nedley said, you need to come to, now, I used to live, Weimar is a little, town in Northern California on the way from Sacramento up to Reno. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I grew up in California, and I've, I've been up that way as I used to go up around, up to the, the mountains uh, farther north. And I used to go fishing and backpacking and camping, and, but I'd never, I'd never been to Weimar itself. So it's just a little small little place, and right there is this lifestyle center, this school, and this uh, depression and recovery program. I think mm -hmm. they have 400 acres, mm -hmm. I think, it's which is a here. lot of land in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And people come there from all over the world who are really, really messed up and <laughs> their lives are just about uh, over. Yeah. And with God's help and Dr. Nedley's help and the staff yeah. and the program, yes. uh, people's lives are, literally their lives are saved. Amen and then their minds come back. Yes, you're and right. And then they can resume normal living. That's right. <laughs> so yeah, wow. So that, yeah, I didn't know what I was getting into either when my wife uh, packed my, my bags and drove me to the airport and I got onto the plane in, in uh, Spokane and eventually landed in Sacramento. And I was, I was a mess when I got there. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for uh, Nathan Hyde, who we both know, yeah, you know, he was the one that came down to the Sacramento airport from Weimar to, uh, pick me up. Uh, I, I don't know if I would have ever gotten there. Yeah. And he picked me up and he drove me up to Weimar about an hour away. And during the drive, he told me his story uh -huh. where he said, oh, I can totally relate. I was on all these different drugs yeah. and uh, my life was totally falling apart. Yeah. And the Lord put me back together too. Amen. Yeah. So, well, uh, we're going to continue this in our next, in our next part. I want to learn more about, you know, what happened to you at the program and what were some of the keys that helped to put your life back together. And until we um, get back to part two, I want to read a Bible verse that really helped me. Uh, this is Psalm 50, verse 15. God is talking here and God says, Call upon me, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Uh, somebody texted me this verse before I went to Weimar. And I did that. I called upon God. I said, God, this is my day of trouble. You've got to help me out of this. And he did. He helped me. He helped Christy. Yeah. And he can help you. That's right. So um, stay tuned for part two of finding hope in depression and despair. This three-part series, Finding Hope in Depression and Despair, is now available on DVD from Whitehorse Media. To order, simply call 1-800-782-4253 or order online at whitehorsemedia.com. To learn even more about how you can overcome anxiety, fear, discouragement, and depression, Whitehorse Media recommends these two easy-to-read pocketbooks, Help for the Hopeless and Secrets of Inner Peace. In Help for the Hopeless, Steve Wolberg reveals personal details about an awful trial he passed through during the summer of 2017, how God brought him through the horror of deep darkness, and how you can find help too, whatever your struggles. In Secrets of Inner Peace, Steve explains how deep, lasting peace is only possible through discovering the love and goodness of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and through the power of His Word. Both of these small pocket books are easy to read, heartwarming, encouraging, and great for sharing with your loved ones, friends, and even with strangers. This three-part DVD series, Finding Hope in Depression and Despair, and both of these enlightening pocket books are now available from Whitehorse Media by calling 1-800-782-4253. That's 1-800-782-4253. A fully illustrated ebook version of Secrets of Inner Peace can also be purchased immediately on the website, secretsofinnerpeace.net. That's secretsofinnerpeace.net.